Hi there, I'm Pastor Jason Kent and uh, I'm so looking forward to sharing the Word of God with you today. And uh, last week we looked at um, an ascending staircase out of 2 Peter 1 and how God wants us to start with faith and really uh, end in love. And that's the ultimate expression of the divine nature is to be a man or a woman who loves the way that God loves. And so I want to continue on this theme of the, the literary staircase. And today we're going to look at Romans 5 and uh, 1 through 5 and make a few comments about the passage overall, but then also look at another set of four stairs. Um, we're going to go up another flight. And so if you want to travel with me today, this is good news. We can be a transformed people, the idea of ascending into all that God has for us, uh, not bypassing faith, but building on it, building on God's grace and ascending into the man and the woman of God that he's calling us to be, to share in that divine nature, as it says in 2 Peter 1. And so today, um, I want us to also uh, just recall the analogy of not only um, climbing a set of stairs, but also, um, as we looked at last week, the idea of parkour. So that modern athletic kind of Gen X, Gen Y kind of um, exercise and, and physical activity where they jump off buildings and it's, it's a physical and uh, athletic prowess. And so um, this idea that we can leap stairs or that we can bypass these steps in some way by doing some kind of spiritual parkour is not God's will. He actually wants us to ascend each stair, um, to tread it out carefully and to grow up into Christ. And so let's hold these two images again um, this week as well. So the context for what I'm about to read us in Romans 5.1, um, we see in Romans 1 through to 4 that Paul sets up the idea that everyone is caught up in sin. Everyone's bound up in original sin, that from the beginning people have gone their own way. They've failed to give thanks and, and even acknowledge God as the, the author and perfecter of life. And, um, and so in this way, mankind as a whole falls under judgment and under the wrath of God. But actually God has made a way through his grace and has brought Jesus into the picture and that everything, the ages have culminated in the coming of Christ in his life, death and resurrection. And so in this way, Paul teaches us that we have been now justified. Should we choose to put our faith in Jesus? Should we choose to um, agree with God's plan for salvation? Then we are forwarded and attributed righteousness through that faith in what Christ has done. And so... The Bible calls this justification and it's, it makes us just as if we'd never sinned. And so this is a really important um, kind of uh, fr framework and idea that we need to understand before we get into the passage that we're about to read. And so we have a new way of relating with God. It's no longer under a law. It's no longer, you know, about what we do, but it's actually about who we are through faith in Jesus Christ. And then there's a way of living that flows from that. Once the heart has been restored, once we've got a heart of flesh that is responsive, our spirit is alive to God through faith. And so let's read now about this justification and what it gives way to. Let's read together. It says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in hope and the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance proven character and proven character hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts, through the Holy Spirit, who he has given us. 
And so this is a, a beautiful passage here about not only justification through faith, but what it leads to. It leads to peace with God. It leads to, um, you know, true hope and true transformation and change. But Paul's not an idealist. He knows that when we come into this peace, that when we find ourselves justified by faith, that life isn't easy. And so here he shows us as well that life is still full of challenges. You know, the need to stand firm, tribulations. And so I want to um, you know, lead us, I suppose, and unpack this passage uh, a little more so that we can understand how it actually applies to us spiritually. But I want us to note the similarities here between Peter and Paul. And we know that Peter and Paul knew each other quite well. Uh, one had gone to the Jews, the other to the Gentiles. And, um, but Paul here starts with, with faith and also ends with love, like Peter in 2 Peter 1. His literary staircase that we ascended last week started with faith and ended with love. And so here we see that they're in agreement and the scriptures are in agreement about our journey as a people. And as we're on mission together as a church community and as we continue to do the Lord's work, we need to be mindful of our growth and what the Lord has for us, that we hold serving him and growing in him as two equal tensions that we need to maintain in our lives. There's no point in us serving him and saying, Lord, you know, I've, I've done these things for you if, you know, our character and our lives um, are amiss. And so I want to encourage us today to stand on that grace, to make every opportunity to grow up into Christ. And so let's have a look together uh, at this passage. So it says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and we exult in hope of the glory of God. So the glory of God, his perfection, his glory, his perfection is our goal. Uh, we want to be like God. It says elsewhere in scriptures, be imitators of God. Um, and so this is our goal. We want to go from glory to glory. We want to be a transformed people. And so the way we do this, it says, is that we've been firstly justified by faith through grace. It says elsewhere in Ephesians. But we then come into the peace of God. So being justified leads directly into a new type of relationship with God. No longer are we under the wrath of God. No, one, no longer are we under judgment. Uh, or do we need to appeal to some kind of law? But this law is now going to be written in our hearts and we come into a, a new relationship characterized by peace. Now, it's not the Western idea of peace, which is the absence of conflict. That's not the kind of peace that Paul's referring to. Here. He's drawing on a rich Jewish heritage, the idea of shalom peace. And so I want to read to us as a, an example of that type of peace from Isaiah 32, 17 to 18. And it says this, and the work of righteousness will be peace. So as we step into Christ's righteousness, if you like, it says that we have peace and the service of righteousness, quietness and confidence forever. So here we see that righteousness leads to peace and righteousness also leads to a quietness and an inner confidence forever. Then my people will live in peaceful habitation and in secure dwellings and undisturbed resting places. This is the kind of peace that Paul's referring to here in Romans 5, that those who have been justified by faith now enjoy a new harmonious peace with God through Christ Jesus. Isn't this good news? And so each person, each one of us today can have that kind of assurance. In fact, that's what theologians would say this passage is actually about, is that we can have a deep sense of assurance because we have peace with God. And so 
It goes on in verse 3 to say, And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. So Paul's not an idealist. He knows that life still happens, that we still encounter the storms of life. In fact, I'm recalled, though, I, I do recall, though, that Jesus, even when he was in the boat, in the midst of a physical storm, that he had absolute peace. He was asleep, it says in the scriptures, on a cushion, you know, and so Jesus wasn't worried by the storms. He had inner peace. He knew who he was. He knew who his heavenly father was and he had absolute confidence. And so that's the kind of peace that you and I can come into. Now, Paul's saying here that, you know, we not only exult in the glory of God and our end result, our, our heavenly perfection, but also our tribulations knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. So tribulations are actually the context for growth. And even though we have this peace, even though we come into the love of God, uh, we can still encounter through life trouble. And uh, in fact, in John 16, 33, Jesus says, in this life, you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. And so... This is the Jesus we know. This is the Jesus we serve. And we can have absolute confidence that we can share in his peace and that he'll find us a way through so that even in the midst of the storm, you and I can have peace, knowing that God will work it out. In fact, in Romans, it says that he works out all things together for good for those who trust him and those who are called according to his purpose. It's Romans 8, 28. And in Romans 8, 29, it says, From the very beginning, God determined that we would become like his son. And so, you know, the context in verse 28 leads straight into 29. Through hardship and the working together of all things for our good leads to us being conformed to the image of his son. Again, God uses these things. Now, it's not always joyful, but let's turn now to James 1, 2 to 4, and it says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let your endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So if God's working all things together for good, the idea here is that tribulations are actually an opportunity for growth. And we know this, like in, in life, in, in, in my humanity, and I'm sure in yours, we get comfortable. We don't grow if we simply cruise along. And uh, if I go to the gym and, and exercise a muscle, it's going to grow if I uh, break it down and it rebuilds itself. And in a similar way, God uses trials and tribulations, doesn't necessarily will them, it's not in his nature that we would suffer, but he uses a broken world and with broken systems and broken people and broken experiences to nevertheless shape us. And this is an important thing that God does not leave us orphaned, but as a father, as a loving father, he shapes us and develops us. And so it says here in James that we are to consider it pure joy. Now that might be tough, but I have learnt over the years to trust God through those trials, and he does. He brings us out the other side, different people with character. So we're, we're exalting not only in the glory of God, but in tribulations, knowing it brings about perseverance. Let's have a look now at the first step that builds then into uh, proven character. That first step is perseverance. So if we're going to be in any form of trial, knowing that we're building on faith through grace, um, perseverance is necessary. Now, we know that perseverance, as in last week, um, it's to bear up under pressure. Now, I'm not talking about constant pressure. I'm not talking about um, sustained pressure to the point where, you know, someone might develop a, a mental health problem or that kind of pressure is ungodly. You know, God doesn't want us to suffer under sustained poverty or sustained, you know, um, illness of any kind, you know, even though we may experience these things, he does provide ways through and support for us 
we don't go through this life completely unsupported in our trial or in our experience. In fact, in um, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape also, so that you'll be able to endure it. And so perseverance is a necessary step in our Christian faith in order to ascend the staircase. We need to be able to endure and to be able to bear up under those things. And so that then gives way, the Bible says, to proven character. Now, proven character is actually about proven worth through testing. And so here, again, we, we look at the context of tribulations. These are times where God will test us. Now, not testing us in the sense that he's a big angry God upstairs somewhere, as N.T. Wright would say, waiting, you know, for us to trip up and to get it wrong. But actually, you know, he's wanting to refine us as a loving father. And if I think about, you know, metals that are um, refined by fire, they're heated and they turn to a, a molten state and there's a slag that rises to the top and you scrape that slag off, and then you can use the molten metal, and it's pure, it's refined, it's able to be used. You don't want lumps of slag left in the thing that you're building or that you're molding. And so in a similar way, God refines our life. So we've got proven character, it's tested character. We could say any number of things about our own character and say, I'm this or I'm that, Um, virtuous in some way but if that's unproven and untested it's an idea only it's not a it's not a reality and so in our proverbs 17 3 it says the refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold but the lord tests hearts and so this idea that the lord is the tester of what is in us and he wants to see pure and refined lives Uh, not ones that are full of slag. And so Job also refers to this. He says, when he has tried me or tested me, I shall come forth as gold. Now we know that Job had a a difficult experience, but nevertheless had proven character in the end. Now we won't suffer like Job. That's Job 23.10, that reference. But yeah, we won't necessarily suffer to the degree of Job, but we, we nevertheless, we do suffer at times in life. But God promises to be with us and to bring us through and to provide for us and to use those experiences is to, uh, to shape us. So it says in our Hebrews 12, 6, that God disciplines those he loves. So we can even look at the shaping experience through testing as being a form of discipline. Um, it says in uh, Hebrews 12, 11, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Don't we know that to be the truth when you're in the middle of change? You might have a difficult marriage situation. You might have a difficult financial or health situation, a difficult situation in your career or stage of life, friendships, relationships. These things will have moments of testing. In fact, you know, there's a famous psychologist, you know, Eric Erickson, who says that when you push through any life stage, there's actually a resistance there that you need to break through in order to have mastery in those key areas. So it's kind of built into life. There's a way that God refines us. And in a sense, we we have to face certain challenges in order to realize our full potential and to be able to grow, to have that proven character. And so um, it it goes on to say, yet those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness, of right relationship, of leading innocent lives. That's the root word of of righteousness. And so we want to live pure and innocent lives to the best of our ability. And so um, God is calling us to be a people of proven character. So we've gone from perseverance to proven character. The next step is hope up our literary staircase today. Hope is not fatalism. It's not saying I hope this happens or I hope that happens. 
in some kind of fatalistic way. In fact, hope is certainty that God has promised and is good on his word. God promises. He makes us all promises. In fact, you know, um, it refers into the scriptures that, you know, the, the covenant promises are yes and amen through Christ. It's in 1 Corinthians. And so, um, you know, you and I are part of God's people. And God gives us certain hope because he has promised to fulfill all that he has said he would do through Christ Jesus. It talks about faith in Hebrews 11 too. It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, for by it the men of old gained approval. So hope and faith actually work together. And here we see in Romans 5, in these steps, we go from perseverance to proven character to hope. Hope is one of these qualities We need to be certain about who God is. We need to be certain about his promises. We need to be certain about this work that he is doing in us so that we don't lose hope. We don't give up, that we don't kind of fall back into a regressive state in our spiritual walk. This is good news. The last step that we see here today is love through the Holy Spirit. Yeah, the Holy Spirit keeps us grounded during our journey of faith and even our trials. Without the Holy Spirit's encouragement, you know, it's not just talking about a general love, like love for the Father, love for the Son, or love for one another, but that personal love that comes to us through the Holy Spirit. And if you're born again, if you know Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, the Holy Spirit has been given to you and I as a gift a gift to help us as an advocate, as a helper. And so we see um, that he's given to us as a helper who is, it says, within us. He abides within us. We are the temple, it says elsewhere in scripture, of the Holy Spirit. So in John 14, verses 16 to 17, he is our helper who is within us. In John 14, 26, it says the Holy Spirit will teach us all things. He brings conviction, John 16, 8. And in John 16, 14, he brings revelation and insight. And so, you know, if we're to have love through the Holy Spirit, we need to be acquainted with the ways of the Holy Spirit and his role. Do we incline our ears in prayer? Do we wait? Do we ask the Holy Spirit for help you know, when we need it? In Romans 8, 15 to 17, it says... If you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children heirs and also heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, there's that idea of trials, so that we may also be glorified with him. Always on the other side of trials and difficult times is our perfection and the Lord works all things together for good. So here we see four stairs, Uh, like in 2 Peter, we had eight stairs last week. This week we only have four and Paul writes to us in Romans 5 about perseverance, proven character, hope and love through the Holy Spirit. This is our journey. At times it might feel difficult to ascend these stairs But can I just encourage you today, persevere. You know, the the trials do pass. God gives us a way out. If we're looking to him, if we're seeking him, if we're following his word and, you know, you're putting on that armour of God, those things can't stick to you long term. The enemy will try and undermine your life and your confidence and your hope and your faith. But through Jesus Christ, we can stand. And so I just want to encourage you today, you know, what do you need to persevere in? You know, what's, what, what is the context for your perseverance? Is it a relationship challenge, a parenting challenge, a health challenge? You know, a relationship challenge, a career challenge, a financial challenge maybe. You know, these are the types of things that often our lives rotate and, and we, we circle around these types of issues. And God, you know, wants to meet with you right now and give you hope and give you strength. And so I want to encourage you, don't give up. 
you know, let's seek God together. I'm going to pray for us today. But firstly, you know, if you don't know the God who saves, if you're watching today and you don't know that there is a God who created you, number one, and who loves you, you know, then today you can have that relationship with him, you know, and God has sent um, Jesus Christ, his one and only son, his representative on the earth to, uh, to, to bring good news, to show you the way to the Father, to bring new life, eternal life. But, you know, we all experience a level of brokenness. The Bible refers to this as sin, a breaking of relationship. And so today, Jesus has come that that relationship might be restored, that that sin might be dealt with. He came and he shed his blood. He paid the, paid the blood price for sin. And today, if you want to know the Father's love, if you want to be forgiven of sin and brokenness, if you want to come into that new relationship and experience God's love and uh, that new hope in life and purpose, then today I'm just going to lead you through a prayer. And so if that's you today and you want to receive Jesus, you want to have eternal life, you want to have new beginnings and fresh hope, pray this prayer with me now. Let's pray. Father God, I come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to be right with you. Thank you that you love me and that you sent Jesus to die for my sins. Jesus, come and live in my heart. Fill and baptise me with your Holy Spirit. Give me a love for people, for your word, and for your church. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Amen. Today, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, or if you prayed it again as a, a prayer of recommitment or renewal or assurance, We'd love to get in touch with you. Just reach out to us um, via our socials and uh, we could, we'd love to get a gift to you. We'd love to connect with you and help you grow in that step, in that decision that you've made today to follow Christ. And so, but also I just want to pray just quickly before we close for you today. If, you've, if you need perseverance, if you need hope in the midst of a trial, just to know that God actually does love you. He wants to bring you through this and he wants to connect with you and he wants you to uh, push through and um, overcome. And uh, so let me pray for you now. If you're watching in this moment, I'm just going to believe that Christ is going to meet with you, that he's going to strengthen you, that he's going to provide a way through for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for all of us who are watching in this moment, Lord God, that you would be with those, Lord, who are experiencing trials and suffering at this time, Lord, I pray, God, that you would strengthen them, that, Lord, you would meet with them and encourage them, Lord. I pray that as they read your word, as they seek you, Lord, through prayer, as they engage with other Christians, Lord, God, that you would strengthen them and bring them into a new and confident hope. Give them light at the end of their experience, Lord, I pray. Anoint them, Holy Spirit, even now where they sit, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, it's been really good to share the word with you today. And uh, I look forward to talking with you soon. Bless you.